All right, so this part that I'm about to say is really key. The instructions say, to be given that y varies directly with x. What does it mean that y varies directly with x? It's one thing, one simple thing. Yeah? Y That's right, y equals ax. That's exactly the definition of it varies directly. It's a constant times x gives you y. So it must be true for these variables. What we want to do, what we want to figure out is what's a. We want to just write down y equals like five x. We don't want that equation. Can we figure that a out? instructions it also says find y when x is 12 so we need to let x be 12 so this is like the first part the second part would be uh, 12 in there 4 y is 20 5 times 4 okay now we can move on y equals negative 0.5 Variables x and y vary directly. Write the equation that relates x and y and find y or x when y equals negative 4. So it's almost the exact same thing. We're trying to find the equation, but then we're going to try and find x when y is a certain thing. Well, they vary directly. That's what it says. So we know that this equation must exist. We know y. And that's a times negative 0.5. We divide by negative 0.5. We get 7.2, negative 7.2 equals A, right? Okay. Y equals negative 7.2 times X. And it says find X when Y is negative 4. This is the first part. We found the equation. Y is negative 4. Finding X divided by negative 7.2. X equals four divided by seven point two is a good calculator. There's one. Point five. Point five. Point five. Point five. Repeating. Okay, so again, if y varies directly with x, so the question is, is this data, data an example of direct variation? Is this data an example of direct variation? If it is, then we know this is true. That's where we always start. So that means that I should be able to take x, multiply it by a, and get y. Multiply by a, and get y. Multiply by a, and get y. I just need to figure out what that a would have to be, right? 
what would a have to be so that one times a is seven? Seven. Have to be seven. So if this is direct variation, this must be the equation. It must be because I have to be able to take this x and multiply it by a and get y. <laughs> okay, one times seven is seven, so a must be seven. So it must also work for every x to y. Well, does it work for this one? No. No, this two times seven is fourteen, not nine. It should, it's nine. It's, it should be fourteen. Two times no, three times seven, twenty-one. Okay. Can you spot a relationship here? What's that? For each, for each x, you add two to the y. X, you add two to the y. In the previous. Oh. Well, one add two. So it would be two x plus one be five. And two x plus five. The run, the run would be two. Multiply this by two. Wait. Yeah. Multiply this two by two and add five. So five plus two. Uh, four plus five. So uh, six ten. plus five. That seems to be working. That's not direct variation, right? Direct variation is strictly multiplied. If it was y equals uh, 2x, yes. But y equals 2x plus 5, no, that's not direct variation. <coughs> Somehow we, we need to prove that every x can be multiplied by the same number to get y. And that's not the case here. OK. 32 and 39. Okay, so hail 0.5 inches deep and weighing 800 pounds covers a roof. The hail's weight, W, varies directly with its depth. Write an equation that relates D and W, then predict the weight of the roof of hail. Weight on the roof of hail, that is 1.75 inches deep. Okay, so we're just looking for Confirmation that there's some direct variation here. If there's direct variation, if y varies directly with d, then, or sorry, w, then w must be a times d. So we always start, when you see that phrase, is directly proportional to, varies directly with, you write that equation. Okay? Uh, well, 0.5 inches deep means that it weighs 1,800 pounds. Well, there is a depth. There is a weight, 1,800 equals A times 0.5. So 3,600, that's what A is. We divide by 0.5 on both sides. And so the equation is W equals 3,600D. So there's the first question answered. What's the equation? Predict the weight of the roof, ha roof of hail that is 1.75 inches deep. So I'm just going to plug that in there and tell me what the weight should be. 6,300. What's that? 6,300. Oh, you multiply by 1.75 and you got 6,300. On top of it. 6,300, that's what it is. Questions about that one? Anytime you see the phrase something varies directly with something else, immediately write down this equation and then try to find things that point you to it. A quick little vocab reminder. What is this A called? It's got a name. What's the name of it? Of variation. Of variation. Very
variation. Who said that? Constant of variation. Right? Because it's a constant, right? Stretch variation. So that's a reasonable name for it. The constant of variation. Any more questions? Y equals AX. It's like this whole section is summed up by Y equals AX. Then let's pass in our homework. Right, so we're supposed to tell whether the data in the table show direct variation. If so, write the equation relating x and y. Uh, if it's direct variation, it has to be equal to y equals, or y has to be equal to a times x. Uh, just look at this first example. This is one of the easiest multiplication problems you could possibly try and do, right? That's all we're really trying to do, trying to figure out what negative 5 times uh, times what gives me 20, what would that have to be? Negative 4. Negative 4. If it's direct variation, this must be the equation. It must be the equation that you give x and get out y. It works here. Does it work here? Does it work here? Does it work here? In here. Check. That's the equation. You can start by writing the equation, like the thing that it's asking for right here, and just testing it. If it doesn't if it works, great, that's the equation. If it doesn't work, it's not direct variation. I can just, uh, could you go back to that one? Yeah. Uh, I thought like the negative one right there and then the four. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that it would, uh, yeah, that it would happen to be a uh, four. Oh, it's even uh, easier to see. Oh, you did positive four? Yeah, that's why I thought it was, uh, I thought it was four, not negative four. So your equation is y equals four x. Whoops. Remember, that since y equals ax, then a always equals? Always, always, every time. Y divided by, y divided by x. Y divided by x. So remember, do y divided by x if you're not sure what you're supposed to do even. But I mean, that's just, that just makes sense, right? x equals, or if x times a equals y, then a must be y divided by x. Okay, but the cost of filter gas tank varies directly with the number of gallons purchased. Okay, uh, so if we call the cost of a fill up, let's call that Y, and we call uh, gallons purchased, call that X, there's your Y varies directly with X. So Y must be equal to A. Direct variation, that varies directly with? Look for that. Yes? When I put it G equals A, um, C, because I put G for gallons and then C for the cost. G equals AC or C equals AG? I don't know. Well, okay. G equals AC. Well, that, is, that would be true. That would be true. It wouldn't be the way that we normally think of it. Right, because if you do G for gallons equals A times C for cost, I mean, if if Y varies directly with X, then X varies directly with Y. They work, they vary back and forth. It's just that now look at what we're gonna ask ourselves to do. Like this is the this is intended to be the output, right? And this would be the input because this is all by itself. So we're gonna plug in. So what kind of stuff are we gonna plug in for C? Yeah. So we're gonna, yeah, I mean, you're right, $44.46, okay. Um, let's see, and what are we gonna put in here? 13. Now is it, do you normally think of this scenario this way? Oh, I spent this much, I'll multiply it by some number and get the number of gallons that I bought. See the thing? It's true. It is true. And it, and it is correct. And whoever's grading pieces of paper should give 100% to it. All right. But it is not quite how we think of this problem. Right? So you normally think, you go to a gas station and you think, I'm going to spend this much money total. And then later I'll figure out how many gallons I bought. Do, 
Well, maybe you do. Do you think that way? I'm going to spend this much money? Usually, I, I just pump the gas, I get some gallons, and I figure out how much it's going to cost. Right? It's usually that way. But the, I mean, sure. That is true. And it will create an equation that allows you to do whatever you want. It's just that normally we would say that the cost is equal to some constant times g, right? Let's look at them both. Let's look at them both. Okay, so if we do it that way, then we solve for a by taking 13 divided by 44.46. First of all, let's like look at the units of this. 13 gallons and 44.46 dollars. When I take 13 divided by 44.46, what's 13 divided by 44.46? A long decimal. 2, 2, 9, 7, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, at the gas station and such and such on the corner there, it uh, is so is gallons per dollar. No, we don't normally we we normally think of it as what? Dollars per, dollars per gallon, right? We flip that over. If we were to flip that over, we would have dollars per gallon, right? If I take one yeah. over 0.292, you can try that yourself. Divided one divided by two, one divided by 0.292, or come over here. Let's plug in uh, that we bought 13 gallons and it cost us 44.46. To figure out what A is, we'll take 44.46 dollars divided by 13 gallons. 3.42. 3.42. What dollars per gallon? That's, that's more like what we are used to hearing. If A is if we lived in some other universe, this may have become the standard. You may, you may want to know just how much gas we can get for one dollar. Right? And that's what this tells us. We can get 0.292 gallons for one dollar. And for two dollars, I can get twice that. For two dollars, I can get three times that. And sometimes you do go into the gas station saying, I have twenty dollars. I cannot spend more than twenty dollars. Of course, you don't have to figure out how many gallons you need to buy because the pump tells you how much you've spent so far. Right? Can we, we, we go into a situation a little bit like that sometimes. Well, in this case, the equation looks like this. Cost equals 3.42 times G. Right? Take the number of gallons, multiply by 342. 342 is what? Represents what? What are the units of 342? Dollars per gallon. Right? Dollars per gallon. You know, dollars per gallon all the time. If we go this way, our A is 0.292, so G equals 0.292C. Okay, so they're both, they can both be correct. Technically, when we went over the definition of direct variation, when this varies directly with this, the first thing is Y and the second thing is X. Okay, that's like the standard. Um, and sometimes you can get away with it. And depending on what the question is, sometimes you can. Right, so remember, this is always the y, and this is the x. y varies directly with x. Yeah, Abby? So like, if they basically say put y equals 3.42 times x, is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you can see by their work, you've gotten to here, then that's fine as well. So if you wrote like instead of C equals A C, if you actually put in the numbers, like forty four point four six equals A times thirteen. Uh -huh. So okay. No. No. No, we want an equation, like it says, that relates gallons purchased to cost of a fill up. We want an equation that relates those two things to each other, meaning a way to go from one to the other. Okay. If what we have is um, well, we have it written down somewhere. 14.46 uh, equals A times 13. 
that's just a, an equation where A can be solved for. Right? It's not a relationship between uh, the gallons purchased and the cost of total. Other questions? Gotta be a function. When, when we write that equation, it's gotta be a function that takes input and gives output. This is not a function. It's not input and output. There's just A has to be this for the equation to be true. This is a function because I can input G and get out C. I can input C here and get out G. All right, so a review question that it seemed like we had a little trouble with from the last homework review. So here we are again. We can expect this to happen as long as we uh, are averaging not doing so well with this kind of question. We'll just keep doing this kind of a question over and over and over until we're through cool with it. All right, so we're going to write the equation of a line. Remember the equation of a line that we like a lot, the most, usually. It's a slope-intercept form. I like that. We want to write that equation. What about that equation can we figure out? That the slope. E the slope. We can figure out the slope. The slope is negative 4 minus negative 1 over... 4 minus negative 2. Is that all together? Yeah. We get negative 3 over 6. That's negative 1 half. That's our slope. Okay. Slope it back here, right? And also do what? Find that y intercept. Find that y intercept by plugging in like negative 2 for x and negative 1 for y, or 4 for x, negative 4 for y. Or we can do what I'm about to do, which is use the point slope form. So y minus, let's go with this guy right here, minus negative 4 equals negative 1 half times. Four. No, x. Sorry, x minus four. Y plus four equals negative one half. X plus two. I just distributed the negative one half in parentheses. Y equals negative one half x minus two. If you're the person you're grading for, use this and, and solve for B and plug back in. Absolutely fine, of course. I didn't ask you to use the point slope form. So, choice is yours. Questions? Take that lack of questions to be that there are no questions. the homework quizzes where we were doing it again and now we're doing it again again. Yeah, we're do it again. We'll do it again and again and again. And then we're gonna do it again. Until until, until it looks like it <laughs> most people are cool with it. Okay. So remember that this is a piecewise function meaning that it is divided into pieces and the pieces are uh, governed by, decided by the x values. I did the highlighting, and it doesn't seem like that was the silver bullet to help you understand it, so let's look at it a different way. Let's look at it like this. Um, 
here's a function f, it's a piecewise function. I can plug numbers into f, right? Like I could plug in three to this function, could I not? Yeah. I could. But I don't plug it into both of those things, right? I only plug it into one. Which one do I plug it into? The bottom one. The bottom one? Yeah. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the x we want to use is three, and that three is bigger than negative six. So it would go right there. Right? You make a choice between the two functions. Plug that in. Okay, so let's just uh, see. What's f of three? Well, that's five six times three. Let's say over one, because it's easier to work with fractions that way. Okay, and that equals cancel those guys out. Uh, that's a two, so we get five halves minus one. <coughs> Uh, equals uh, five halves minus two halves is three halves. So now I put in three to the function f. That means it goes into that function because it's greater than negative six. When I put three into the function, I get out three halves. Here's a way to sum up all that information, or here's another way to sum up that information. This went in, this is what came out. That's what a graph tells you, right? This is what it went in, and this is what came out. This went in, and this came out. So what went in is three, and what came out is positive three halves, one half, two half, three halves, right there. What am I starting to create over here with this point? The what? The one point per. Well, so far I have a point. What is that point a part of? The line. And the graph as a whole, right? This, will, this graph will be like two lines could Frankenstein together, right? Okay, let's do that again. How about if I want to do f of six? Which function will I use? The bottom one. The bottom one. Okay, so let's do that. Five sixths times six over one times one. That's what we're out. We got five minus one, and that's so last time I was asking you questions about uh, does it seem like these numbers have anything to do with each other? What, what are some that we kind of decided they probably do have something to do with each other? Yeah. Miles per gallon and weight. Miles per gallon and what? Weight. And weight. Makes sense, right? If my car is heavier, it seems like you would have trouble keeping up its fuel efficiency. What are some things that think are related as well? Uh, energy related, uh, power and torque maybe. Seems like power, I don't even, I mean, I'm not a car guy, I don't even know what the difference between those two things is. I mean, I watched a really brief explanation how power is more like, uh, like muscle cars have power, they have horsepower so they can go fast, but trucks have torque so that they can tow things. Uh, low end bodybuilder type power, right? Yeah. Torque and weight. Torque and weight. You think the heavier something is, the, the, the it more may weight. tend to well, it needs to have more for, more uh, torque and power to be able to pull itself, right? Um, how about some things that probably aren't very related? Price and torque. Price and torque. These, yeah, you could. Uh, have a lot of torque in this really crummy car that has a lot of power, but it doesn't have a lot of other type of things. So it's uh, not very expensive. Yeah, so it seems like maybe these, those things are not very related. Okay. So what I want to do is examine these data sets and uh, ask some questions about them. And uh, eventually we're going to actually find a one number that will tell us how closely related this data is. Or really the, the word is correlated, how closely correlated they are. And it can all come down to one number. And if that number is close to one or negative one, then they're very closely correlated. Closer to zero than it is, the worse of a correlation it is. Okay? So, you know me.
So, um, which two data sets do you think are the most correlated? Jethro? Uh, Knowledge per gallon, Bibby, and Price. Knowledge per gallon in the city and price. You think you'll, you will very predictably pay more for a car that is more efficient. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, we, we, can, we can examine that. How about uh, anybody else think something else is even a more closely related? Um, well, I, I'm looking at the Jeep Cherokee and the mm -hmm. Ford, and they're almost exactly the same, except mm -hmm. the only difference is, is that their prices, uh, uh, the prices are, are like five grand difference mm -hmm. and uh, how much uh, how much power is it and so, so price and power price and power yeah you think price and power are closely related yeah. okay price and power are closely related the most closely related of any data is that, that's what I'm asking is it the most closely yeah. related of anything yeah. well it seems uh, like even like some of the uh, most uh, uh, fuel efficiencies and stuff like that are lower on the list. So, uh, like the t uh, Prius, it gets uh -huh. 48 miles per gallon uh -huh. and then uh, 51 miles per gallon, it's yeah. way low on the ground. So I'm thinking that even though uh, the, uh, the, I don't think the miles per gallon is not going to make a big deal, I think it's just going to be the price and how much power the thing actually gets. Well, okay. 2400 or 24,000. And the Prius is an interesting car. Yeah, you got twenty four thousand dollars for a three hundred fuel horsepower car. <laughs> what do you think, Nathan? Good uh, power and torque seem more closely related since you can see yeah, they're very easy. close to one another. The numbers the themselves are very close yeah. to each other. Okay, yeah. so maybe power and torque are the most closely related. Or weight and torque because you got two the same units. Yeah. So is there some way we can visually tell if these things are closely related? Because we're having to look at the numbers and ask ourselves how closely related are the numbers and really it's not even that the numbers are close to each other right that doesn't matter does it that if this is 168 this is close to 168 does that mean that they're closely related to each other no it doesn't have to be if this is if i let's see if this is closely related this is one and this is uh let's see two this is two and four four and eight six and twelve 12 and 24, okay? If this is X and this is Y, do those seem to be closely related to each other? The question is really when one goes up, does the other one go up? Like as we move over in the X's, do the Y's move predictably? Yeah, in fact, these are so closely correlated, that number that, that tells you how closely correlated they are would be one, exactly one. It would be they are the most correlated they could possibly be, right? There's actually an equation that tells you how to get y if you know x. Just take x and multiply it by 2. Well, that's not the, the case here. The, the point I'm making is that 1 and 2 are close to each other, but 12 and 24 are not very close to each other. But they are highly correlated. So, let's see. First, let's start looking at some different relationships. Here is uh, fuel efficiency, city and highway. Do they seem to be correlated to each other? There seem to be some kind of a relationship, some predictability between fuel efficiency city and fuel efficiency highway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, as I go over and up, over and up, looks like kind of a linear correlation. Price and weight. More scattered. More scattered, yeah. Less correlated. And not as correlated. About power and torque. Pretty, pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty it's dang close. Than both miles per What's that? It looks closer than both miles per gallon. Oh, it looked closer than the, than the, the city and highway. Uh, fuel efficiency and weight. Slightly scattered. Yeah, Slightly, but uh, fairly close. Better than the price and what did I have? Price and weight. Yeah. Even like you can price. look at it and tell it the more it weighs, the less uh, fuel efficiency it has. Right. 
Except for this guy right here. What's that guy? That's probably the Prius, right? The fuel efficiency is way up there. But it's very, uh, well, yeah, the full fuel efficiency is, is just way out there. Um, you'd expect a, a car that weighs this much to be about this fuel efficient somewhere here, but it's just above the rest. And price versus torque. Pretty much completely it's like all over the place. There, there's some correlation. It's not completely, it's not all over the graph, right? But it just doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of a relationship between those two. I think that's the last one I had. Okay. Let's take a look at power and torque. This seems very closely related. Now, now we're, we're just going off of our brains. Our brains look at it and they tell us that it seems like there's some kind of a relationship between those things. Why? Why does it feel like they're related to each other? Just by looking at this graph. Because you can like, guess what comes next. Kind of. You can guess what comes next. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You guess what comes next. Um, does it seem like they follow a, a pattern? Like, yes. are they making a shape? Almost. Yeah. They're yeah. almost yeah. making a line. They're, they're close to making a line. No, the line of best fit. Was that? Line of best fit. The line of best fit is exactly what we're talking about. The line of best fit. Okay. The line of best fit is the one that is, well, who wants to just come up and draw a line that they think is at least close to the line of best fit? Line best fit looks pretty good, right? Not the best straightest line. No, not the best straightest line. That's all right. So the V line of best fit is the one where, well, look at these, these points. This point is a little above, right? This point's a little below. This point's a little above. This point's a little below. Okay. These would be like positive distances, right? and these are negative distances. If you took this guy minus the Y value on the line, you get a positive number. If you took uh, this guy minus the y value on the line, you get a negative number, right? And so if you add up all those distances, the best line would be one where you get at least that the difference there coming out to be about zero, right? The positives and the negatives all total up to kind of cancel each other out. That'd be the line of best fit. Okay? That's the line we want to find. Okay. Now, finding that line by hand is incredibly tedious. Not that complicated, but tedious. And so. We'll let technology find that for us. Okay, but then we want to interpret the results. Okay. But um, we can kind of guess at it. Okay. So here I'm gonna pass some of these out. Okay. And I want you to take a look at this data. You can kind of see where these points are. They've got the x and y axis. Okay. I want you to just draw a line through the data, highly correlated or not. It's kind of correlated. Okay. And then find the equation of that line. We found equations of lines already, right? Point slope, two points, y intercept and slope, all those guys. Probably going to be a two point situation. Now, your line of best fit does not even have to go through, like, it doesn't necessarily have to go through any of those points. For instance, for instance, my scatter plot looks like this. There's some data points. Here's some other data points. That line of best fit, do you think it's going to go through any of those points? No. No, it, it seems like there is a correlation. It seems like it will go right through them. It doesn't actually touch any of them. Average is out. So the points on this line, like if I wanted to find those two points, I'd actually have to just kind of approximate them. It's not actually contained in those points. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a line that you think is the line of best fit. Do not force it to go through any two points. Okay. Just draw the line that you think is the line of best fit and find the equation of that line.
tried to split it up kind of evenly. There's five different graphs, the graphs we just looked at. So when each of you draw that line that you think fits the best and then find the equation on that line. Does the line have to start at like zero? Or no, no, no. I mean, if the, if the line doesn't start at zero, like this one, if it doesn't start at zero. Okay, so that, that has to be touching on the y-axis. Uh, yeah, it should go back and touch the y-axis somewhere. Okay. It's a line, goes on forever. All right, let's look at this, this graph. Some of you have it, most of you don't. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about it because I've seen more than a couple people go like that. Now, you may be doing your best to, to try and do what you've seen done so far, but does it seem like that's how the data moves? No. Like as we go this way, we go this way? As we go right, we go up? No, what are we doing? Are we Are going down? As this gets bigger, what's this? Negative one. I mean, what is this axis? Fuel the fuel efficiency highway. As your fuel efficiency goes up, it seems like your weight would go down. down. So actually, the line would go down. And there's a decent line. Now, when I try to take this line, this point into consideration and think about the distances between all the points, this one's kind of doing what to the line? It's curving it up. Well, not curving, it's gotta be a line. But it's kind of messing it up. What we call an outline. It's lying out there, seemingly not in line with the rest of the data. Okay. And it's because the fuel efficiency of the Prius is so high. Um, so, because this, this line that we would draw, the line of S-fit, goes down, what kind of slope does it have? Kind of slope, it has a negative slope. Going down and to the right is what we call a negative slope, so this is what we call a negative correlation. So this data, negatively correlated, negatively correlated. How is this correlated? Positive. Positive correlation. Positive correlation. How about this data? Positive, Positive but just really, I mean, if you, if you put a gun to my head, I would say it's not, it's just not very correlated. It's just scattered all over the place. Get, tell me how much a car, tell me how much a car or a vehicle costs. I'm not going to be able to very well predict how much it weighs. Light cars can cost a lot. Heavy cars can cost not very much. How are these related? Correlated. Positively co-related. Positive. I don't know. If you drew a line of dust, would still kind of fit. In this case, the, the, the Prius is way by itself, but it's not so, as much of an outlier because it's not so far off of the pattern. Okay. So it's not an outlier so much, it just still kind of follows the trend. It's a little bit off, but it, it's not so much an outlier as it was in that other data set. You have like the, uh, when you go to like the uh, the power and the torque, uh -huh. it, uh, it it basically does the same thing it, as for mile uh, for for uh, for uh, miles per gallon and stuff like that. Yeah. It's just that there's more of them uh -huh. that are in, in the power. This price of torque, but the one before the power and torque. Mm -hmm. See like no, uh -huh. what else? Oh, oh right. Yeah, see all of them are all up there. It basically does the same thing. It's just that there's more of them for the power and torque than it was for uh, <laughs> What are we seeing here? This seems to be a grouping, right? Yes. Yeah, What's that group? The awesome group. Yeah. What kind of vehicles are we seeing in that group probably? Heavy Chevy. Heavy Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> well, their power is high and their torque is high. Yeah. Trucks. Okay, and kind of another group right here. What kind of group do you think that might be? Mid-sized sedans. Yeah, sedans, maybe crossovers, and maybe uh, SUVs, things like that. 
And you guys down here? Crazy. Small, small cars. You know it's Alright, so let's talk about Let's talk about I asked you to find the equation of the line. Now, if I'm just guessing at it, this is all guesswork. Okay. I've drawn this line, and now hmm, I need a couple points. It looks like maybe I could put a point on that line right there. Okay. I'll make it a different color. I don't want to make it blue like all those other guys. So it looks like at 250, comma, what would you say that is? 245. Okay, it looks like. Let's call it 250 comma 245. Right. Um, you know what it looks like? There's a point right there on the grid. That's nice. So what's that point? 100. 100. That's a big one. Yeah, the biggest one. Um, so we have those two points. Can we find the equation of a line given two points? We just did what I'm going to do, right? Find the slope. In point slope form or slope intercept form, we got the equation of our line. Yeah. Um, in this case, like since when you look at the line, if there's sorry, I cannot think. The point that's on the grid, like what you just did, mm -hmm. couldn't you just count the rise over run with um, for the slope? I'm sorry. Up to here. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not really going to count it. What you're going to do is y2 minus y over x2 minus x1, even though you might think you're not, right? Because you're not going to go, all right, got to count from 100 to 245. One, two, three, four. Well, I mean, so like, the amount, gonna do that, right? um, the amount of the scale you're, like, passing. So instead of it being, like, 100, 100, 100, you count, say, it's, like, four spaces up and then four spaces over, and then you use the numbers that correlates on the actual scale. Axis, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would still say you're doing subtraction. Okay. Even when you go like this, you go 100, 200, or sorry, yeah, but each of these is 50. 50, 100, you're, you're counting the space between these things, that's what subtraction is, right? Okay. And, and to make it simple, you could look at this y value, this y value, you say, well, that's 245. How far is it from 100 to 245? Well, pretty easily, it's 145. What did I just do? Subtraction. 245 minus 100. But yeah, I mean, question. Answer the question is yes. You could count it off. Um, so now we want to figure out how do I take this data and find not a line that's close, but the line of best fit. And what is that number that tells me exactly how well correlated they are? So to do that, we are going to use some, um, some technology. Okay. So I guess I should have texted you to borrow a calculator. But I will just show you. So first we have to pick two pieces of data, two data sets that we want to relate to each other. Isn't there supposed to be 250, 250, not 245? She's, she's got a little. It's oh, a little below. Okay, so I couldn't yeah, it's hard to tell, but not far away. Um, no, if I use 250, 250, it's not that far off of the point that I picked, right? It would, be, it would at least be a line that's close. Um, so, uh, I would have to get calculated, but I would just take the rest of class to do. Um, How many of you have graphing calculators? I have one, but I don't have any batteries for it. Okay. I have one. How many of you own graphing calculators idea. and can buy batteries before we have class again? I have no exactly. idea on how to use one. Oh, do you have one? Yes. Okay. Uh, how many of you have a computer with Microsoft Excel on it? Great. Maybe. How many of you have a computer with internet access? Okay. Then let's do this. Um, let's go Google line of best fit 
calculator. I don't know what website's gonna come up. I don't know what the number one result will be. I don't know who makes it, but I'm sure the number one result will make it pretty easy for you to find this line. All you need to do is give it all of the data points. Where do they come from? Scatterplot. Scatterplot, or exact, the exact right numbers, but you hear from this spreadsheet. <laughs> Okay. Pick one that you think is the most highly correlated, okay, and use that data to create the line of best fit. Okay. Okay. 